Hi everyone, I made the mistake of looking at this screen, not this one, which I didn't realise we got to the end. So welcome, here we are, another live stream. Gosh, these months just fly past, absolutely fly past. Um, and I, I can't believe we're round again, but welcome everybody. I think I've said hello to everyone in chat and I hadn't got as far as... Um, uh, Cookie Bot, so welcome Cookie Bot. Tim's just made it back from Statfold where he was showing off Port de Norwick, which was my last model railway I did. Um, he's been showing off all weekend. And I've been there looking at it as a little mini me on the stairs, I think, checking out what he's been up to. And he's had a few silly half hours running loads of trains, but it looks like it went well. Um, so good to have you with you, Tim. And I know John, brackets bracken, further up went and saw it earlier, so I've seen photos. Um, so I'm just gonna, oh, and Adam has also joined, so hi Adam. I'm just gonna start by thanking my moderators. I've seen Norm, um, Digger and Timber also will probably make an appearance. I'm not sure actually if Digger got back to me, but thank you to my moderators who chase off any bots who turn up, which is rare to be fair, but also delete any rude comments you make about things. So just be careful. And uh, well, there we go. So, this week, I am talking about getting started in 3D modeling. So we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute because it's actually what I do all day. And I sat down and I recorded what I did Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and part of Saturday for my modeling. And, and I am doing other stuff as well. And it gets, I, was, I haven't done a character, which is what's up on the screen when I get there. Ooh, for years, probably two, three years. And the last time I did one from scratch, like this one, was probably a soaker for the Clone Wars, which is maybe three, four years ago now. So that, probably three years ago. So it's been a while since I've done a character and it was about remembering how to do stupid things like just pose them. And I had to go and look at videos that I've looked at before. And so it's been a bit of a learning curve this week, which is good. Um, normally I do things like this though. So these are my current, um, things that I've been working on. This is pod racer number two that I designed. This is Sibulba. Now I need to come up with names. And I obviously can't use the Star Wars names because, um, well, the IP'd and all that. And this is going on a Kickstarter that'll be up uh, probably mid, early, early mid June, somewhere in June. Anyway, so this will be up in June. And um, Sibulba is obviously very well known. My clip was a bit... I had a... Um, I hadn't levelled my plate, so you can see the gap through there. That's because my plate's not quite levelled. And so it was a bit a bit off. This side's fine. Um, the plate was levelled better at the front than the back. Um, anyway, this is Sibulba, so I need to rename him. And at the moment, I'm just thinking about names. I'm going to put it on Discord, uh, probably when I get around to it at some point, asking for names. But if anyone has any great names for pod racers based on the existing names, so that was Sibulba. And I'm thinking about Bully Bullhorn or something for him, or Bully, or I don't know, something like that. But just Bully, perhaps. Maybe even just one name, names. Um, this was Ben Quadrineros. And he's what you're going to be seeing all this evening when I get around to putting that on. And this is um, Ben. I think he's going to be Bob. I think he's just going to be Bob. So this is probably going to be Bob. I know what his surname is. Quadrineris is a four engine. So I'm kind of like Bob four pack. I'm crap at names. So if you have some good names, please put them. And then this is Mohonic. He's the one that looks a bit like a bull. Um, and that's quite a cute little diddy one. You compare that to say, any of the others, um, oops, that you can see the difference. They, they're quite big, and Sibulba is probably the biggest one in real life. Obviously, I can't really get him any longer than that. Um, but yes, this is a wee diddy one. But he's quite a big man, so he's gonna, he's just gonna fill this. Um, so those are what I've been working on recently. Not what we're going to see this evening, so I just didn't video those. Sixteen hours took um, of footage sped up took four hours to render out for some reason so not in a rush to do huge time lapses again but i would be doing these for patrons so I can talk through the process of doing a character just for something a little bit different and I do exclusive patron videos that about four people look at um, so the first bit of the video I'm going to put up in a bit 
it's from there. And the second bit is um, just the stuff I recorded this week. So I probably, yeah, it's 16 hours footage in total. But I think I left it running when I went to supper one night. So it's probably one of them's got a big long gap in it and I just didn't have time before I dumped it out. Um, so let's go look in chat. Um, Richard was at Snapful today. Hi, Richard. Good. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been to Statfold before lockdown, probably the year before lockdown. For those of you who don't know, Statfold Barn is um, the guy who owns Hunslet Engineering Company that used to make railway, little railway engines. Um, and he's got his own private, big size, full size, um, but narrow gauge railway. And he's got everything from sugarcane locos to Welsh quarry Hunslets, not a surprise, um, through to just anything you can imagine. I think it was a model as weekend this weekend, but they had trains running, buses running, and it's great. They've got more and more every year, you know, the car park's muddy one year, the next year a little bit more hard standing car park. You know, they put a lot of money into it and it is effectively just a private big railway, what any man would have if they had the money to do it. Well, not any man, I mean, I'd probably build a space park, but hey. Um, so there we go. I think, um, so polite saying to you back, Kathy, I think that's about the cold weather. Um, we're not talking about biscuits today, Richard. No, I think we did biscuits to death. I can talk about chocolate and I can eat chocolate coming out of my ears, but we've done that. Um, Raverson Express, hello. Yesterday, the new FET foil arrived. Hope I can print again in the next few days. Do you know the last time I need to change a FET? I, I cheated and I bought two new vats for about 30 quid. And every time my last two, this is only on the little Mars. Every time my FEP's gone the last two times, I've literally just put a new vat in and I've still got the old two. So I now have two that need changing and I'm on the last new vat. So next time I really will need to change the FEP. Um, I'm changing it all the time on my um, big one, perhaps. Um, but yeah. Right, so Lee, we're talking about naming here for my things. Regarding names, create a naming language. One with basic words for colours, basic adjectives, animals, then you can mix and match to create new names. Okay, um, it's going to be in English. I want to do posters of them at some point with a picture of the, um, oh, the background will be the flag, a picture of the um, quad, you know, the pod racer, it's going to be called the galactic racer, and then the person over top um, as a model that I've done so that I can, um, basically create something for each of them to use as advertising around a racetrack, really. Um, Bobster. <laughs> I like it. Bobster. Um, I just was really channeling minions, I think, with Bob. So it'd be Dave. Um, Norm says very nice. Thanks, Norm. Um, Tetraion. Tetra is Greek for four. I was struggling, thanks, Door 21, to think of different languages for four. Um, and I was, I just, I got as far as cat, but Bob cat sounded a bit, maybe, Bob crap, cat, with short for French cat. But everything, all the languages I know are really Latin based. And I did Latin at school, but I never did Greek. So tetra, tetraion, or tetra is Greek for four. He, he's quadrineros in it. So anyway, I need to spend a bit of time creating names. So um, that is gonna be my thing, I think. Uh, hi, Matt Smith. Um, welcome. Hi Andy, bit late to the show. Uh, I wouldn't worry, um, you know, it's good that you're here at all. I'm always impressed that people turn up on a Sunday evening. Um, we've got Silent Witness. We're doing all 245 episodes that are available on iPlayer, the joys of iPlayer. And we're on about season 10 or 11 at the moment out of 20 plus. So um, we just had that running and that's what I would be watching if I wasn't here. Um, Hi Monique, Monique from Brisbane has arrived. Early morning, nice to have you here. The we've all changed our hours. I don't know if you've changed and whether you're now closer or further apart again. Um, and Tim, Statfold is now a trust and is open for much of the year. However, the steam spectaculars are the best days to go if you can. So t I didn't say where it was, I said it was close to me. It's near Tamworth, um, which is kind of up the M42, about junction nine or ten somewhere around there on the m42 so in the middle of the country really and definitely worth going and i'd heard it was open it used to only be open four days a year i've heard it's open a lot more 
and um, if you can go, they do have some beautiful engines. They have a whole roundhouse full of different, really fascinating, everything from rust buckets that need preservation and restoring through to beautifully immaculate working um, steam locos. And they do a lot of work on restoration as well. I think they even might build new ones. So you, there's a couple of work sheds, if you can go around there. And when we were around, they had all the blueprints for all of the original Hunslet. So very exciting place to go, definitely. Um, hi to the creative modeler, HO. Great to have you with us. And <laughs> Ravenson, my cat's name is Billy Bob. Oh, Billy Bob Thornton. Um, hi, Mike Espo, Diecast Customs and more. Welcome. And then Cookie Bob, Bobcat is a mini digger excavator. Yeah, I was thinking that. That's why I was thinking. It's also, to me, a Bobcat is a thing that you... Am I right? Isn't a Bobcat like a toboggan? Um, anyway, I was thinking Q-U-A-T, um, Bobcat, maybe for him. But I was quite keen on the four pack as well, but then I decided not. See, this is why I'm rubbish on names. Um, so Lee said, love Silent Witness. Are you still on Amanda Burton? No, I think she goes out somewhere like season eight. So we're a couple of seasons past her. At the moment, it's Leo, Harry and Amelia Fox, who's Nikki, isn't it? I can never remember her name because it's the character name and the actor name gets confused. But no, we're still on those three. And I get people say, oh, have you had so and so yet? No, we're still on Leo, Harry and um, Nikki. So that's who we've got at the moment. And I have no idea. I was very excited whenever they swap over um, and we get someone new. Though mostly it's they come in and then cycle through and presumably leave at the end. Oh, money, you are early, 5.12. I'm awake at 5.12 quite frequently, but never up enough to watch um, my phone. Um, and Tim says, yes, Staffold have done some new builds. So I'm going to put the movie on in the background, mostly because... It's just going to go for a long time. Um, and so I, I'm just going to put it on. It's about an hour and a half, I think. It, it is, um, yeah. So just to, I want to talk about 3D design generally. And I could have spent a lot of time producing something for this, going through the basics. But I don't really feel that is that interesting to people. Um, so I wanted to really talk about how you get into 3D modeling, where you might want to get into 3D modeling and how to start, how I started my journey in it. So I can recommend to you um, just the way I've worked. And bear in mind, this is all fairly new to me. Um, I have been modeling for decades, but in the real world, and I'm not much of a kit basher scratch builder. I prefer to research things and produce them exactly as they were. So in some ways, 3D design is great. But for these, I want them to look like the ones that are there, but I, I, I need to be 20% different for IP reasons. Otherwise, you just get a cease and desist um, scrapped on you. So although they're similar, they're not the same, not by 20%, um, hopefully. Um, and some of that is just around, you know, 3D prints can't do some of the things that, you know, like the cabling. This bit, actually this bit here, um, this cable here that goes, that's been one of the hardest bits to sort because I want it robust enough that it actually holds the engines back. So everything's actually tensioned, but um, thin enough that it looks like a cable. Obviously it's never going to be as thin. Um, you know, the cables that you've got all over the place, the handles that they hold on to, they're just too thin. You have to bulk things up. I printed something for Second Dynasty. They've got a Kickstarter. I'm going to do a plug for it. It's not out yet. It's the Erebus shuttle. It's on Kickstarter. I probably should have put a link for it. So if anybody wants to look for it, it's by Second Dynasty. And um, it's on its pre-launch page. I've printed it. I was going to put it together today, but I sat down and read a book instead. So bad me. I didn't work all of today. Um, but yeah, he goes live on the 26th. So I'm going to put something up for that. But I can really... Ben, who's the owner of Second Dynasty, is the reason I do what I do now. And he's been so supportive. So I will, you'll be seeing that coming on um, my social media over the next few um, days when I get around to doing it. Because, um, you know, it's a real pleasure to be able to support him. He supported me so much and he gives me plugs. So it's a real pleasure to be able to support him. Um, so, yeah. 
So uh, Lee Lavery says, I always find Waking the Dead scratch the same itch too. I haven't actually watched Waking the Dead. Um, I've seen all the CSIs. We watched all the original Criminal Intents and some of these. We've watched them all through a lot of them, but yeah. So Binny Dior, are we doing a Star Wars character? I probably should talk about what I put up, shouldn't I? So I put this going and I first of all want to say this is actually Make Human. This is a brilliant um, program for producing basic humans. You can go through and change all of the faces, everything, everything from nose and nostril size. What you can't easily produce are aliens, which is what I'm producing here. So I went through, and this is about version four, and I created something that had a big head, long stringy arms, and a very short body. The first time I ended up with too much hidden geometry and it was all distorted and the nose like mm, curled around on itself and wasn't manifold. It was just gonna cause me problems with printing and I'd have to retopologize it all into better mesh. So I decided that I would do this. But Make Human is a great way because it's really simple to get a figure and to rig it. I actually rigged this three different ways. So you'll see a lot of rigging happening on this. And I've rigged it about 20 times. And if you keep seeing my main desktop flash up behind it, it's because I'm going onto the other screen to look for um, my reference photos or something, to, to, to move them or something. So because I'd done it in Make Human, it brought in eyes and a mouth as well. And you can add all of those things in. And I go through it in a great detail on my Patreon video. Um, Make Human is free, Blender is free, and that's the two programs I'm, I'm now in Blender that I'll be talking about. But I'm not here actually to talk about programs. I'm here to talk about how you actually get started, the physical process of how you actually start modeling and how you get into it. And this just happened to be what I'd done this week. And I actually mostly do hard surface modeling, which means I start with a cube. Um, this is very much Although I do it in the same methodology because it suits me better, I do a bit of sculpting in this. I actually ended up not using my sculpted pieces because I can't sculpt for taffy, really. So um, I prefer to take a vertex, the one of the little dots, and move it than to use a brush to distort it. It's just, just what I'm more used to. And I tend to use a mouse. I have got a pen tablet now that works. It was 25 quid. But um, yeah, this is definitely... Um, easier for me to manipulate these vertices than it is for me to go in and do that with a sculpting brush. Uh, so Binny asked, are we doing a Star Wars character? So this is the dude that goes in, this is the first um, pod racer I did. So this is Ben Quadrineros, who we're gonna call Bob. I, I haven't, um, someone suggested I put the names underneath. I haven't done the naming yet, so they're all just BQ or some other. I need to change all the names on all the files when I decide what it's gonna be. So this is Bob, let's call Bob, but it's actually Ben Quadrineros and he has a massive head and you'll see his picture pop up occasionally. A massive head and um, a need to have pilots to go in to all of these for the Kickstarter. And realistically, I don't earn enough money off them to pay somebody to do it for me. And for all my future Kickstarters, I would like to offer some figures. I'm thinking about doing temples next, which wasn't what I was going to do but I still haven't quite thought what I want to do for a space station and my spaceport didn't go down at all well and I need to work out why my spaceport didn't go down at all well and just think very carefully about what I do for a space station which was top of my poll list. So I think I'm going to do um, a Temple of Light and Temple of Dark, um, one of which is Jedi and one of which is Sith inspired. So one will be blacks and reds, the others will be blue and gold with, and they'll all have cloaked figures or tattooed figures or whatever. So I need temple guardians to go with them. Um, so yeah, so I need to up my game on minis. So I need to really learn minis. And I have done all this before, but it was a couple of years ago. So remembering it all has taken a bit of time. Um, but you know, it's like everything. When you do it every day, like I do, it, it doesn't actually take that long to get back up to scratch and to keep with it. A little bit of a plastic surgery here to get rid of his stomach, which just came out and made human like that. So it is a Star Wars character, it's the guy with the big head, and he's famous for the fact that his power couplings go, these little bits here in the middle go, and these are bright pink and glowing, and his four engines go um, everywhere around the things. But he makes five million per gat because he had a bet with somebody and he didn't even need to cross the start line, so he actually probably made more money than anybody else out of it. Um, so yeah, so it is a Star Wars character for the pod racer, it's a pilot. And if I could find somebody who would do them at a price I could afford, that's fine. 
um, but I haven't, so there we go. Um, so Ravenson, it looks not very human. It isn't very human. Um, that is actually one of the advantages that it's not very human. But humans would be much easier because I could actually just create a human in Make Human and then just have to put the clothing on. For this, I have to create him and I, he's going to be okay. Um, but my biggest problem will be someone like Saboba who walks on his hands with his feet in the air. I'll have to look at him. It might be his knees in the air. It's, it's a really bizarre thing. I'm very confused about how I'm going to do that. So he'll probably be a base human to start and then I'll have to distort everything. Um, but yeah, it's, there we go. <laughs> um, Jewel 21, make human looks more like made gnome. <laughs> yeah, he, he gets a bit better as, um, he gets closer to the character. Obviously I don't want him to look exactly like the character because again, for IP reasons, he has to look close though. So he's closely based on it, but not the same. I think if you look, he's, he does look quite different in some ways, but there we go. Um, and Andy says, Kathy, please say hello to my beautiful wife visiting us in Buenos Aires back in two weeks. Very nice. Do you know, I almost went to Buenos Aires when I was six weeks old. My dad was out there working and he said, I, and he wanted to come back. So he said, oh, I haven't seen my wife and child, children in ages. Can I come back? And obviously I was six weeks old. And he thought they'd let him come back. And they said, oh no, we'll fry your wife out. So I had my smallpox vaccine and everything. And then they decided that I was too young. So I got left behind with my gran. And my sister went to Argentina. I mean, I was six weeks. I wouldn't remember it, but there we go. It's apparently very beautiful. Mum loved it there. She said it was, um, you know, they loved kids. So um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, Binny Jewel, that, this character is that one guy from the pod race in The Phantom Menace. He is indeed that one guy. Um, the creative model, eh, Joe? I love Blender so much, but all my videos that I use Blender in and resin printing get much less views. Yeah, I find that as well. Um, so I, it's, unfortunately for me, this is my full-time job now. So it's where all my time goes. It's not unfortunate for me. I love doing this, but it's where all my time goes. So it's where my videos will end up going. I'm supposed to be doing a series of Bad Batch dioramas whilst that series is on. And I've got around to doing one video and starting a second and that's it. But real-time modeling is just such a difficult, thing to do um, when, you know, I want to do a Kickstarter in June. It's a week to do a pod race. So the first one took two or three weeks because I was working through issues with how to get the connectors to work. But the, they're getting shorter each one that I do. I mean, the last one was a lot simpler, um, but I'm getting quicker at them. So they're looking really cool. I'm getting quicker. Um, people are still telling me which ones I want to do. I was originally going to do eight, but I think what I'll do is six in the base core set and then one as a sort of almost immediate stretch goal and one as a maybe 10 grand stretch goal and we'll see. And then I'll have an idea whether I'm going to breach that or not and I can work on it during the Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, so there we go. Bye Monique. Um, Binny Jewel, have you ever considered making Star Wars characters and selling model as D&D characters? I'm trying to learn modelling for this reason. There's already so many great people out there that have already covered so many of the characters already. I just don't feel that's a market I want to go into. My first love is most definitely terrain and um, vehicles and starships and buildings and the scenery that goes with them rather than the people. I'm doing the people because actually to do a Kickstarter, I really, they do better if you have minis. There's no doubt about that. They do do better if you have minis and people can either buy the minis or they can buy the um, uh, terrain. Um, I've been doing too much for my Kickstarters. So, you know, yeah. So anyway, I'm working on this. I, I actually um, need to start talking about how to get into 3D um, modeling, don't I? Uh, so Rome Saints Press, the program should be called Make Up Ugly Creatures Instead of Make Human. No, sadly on it, you can't make up ugly creatures or it would have been much easier. The thing you make are humans and then I had to spend a lot of time converting it to an ugly creature. Took quite a lot of time, I promise you, to make it look anything but human. Um, Raven Snakes Press, by the way, there's also a program called Dow's 3D that should be good for creating figures, but I've still not tested it. So I want to sell these figures. And one of the things that's very good about Make Human is if I use it, there's no limitations on me being able to use it commercially as a base mesh. 
I mean, I'm obviously doing stuff afterwards, but, um, you know, it, it, so I'd have to check. Whatever it is, um, you know, um, yeah, whatever it is, it has to be able to be used um, for me to be able to sell it. Back Monique, hi, great to have you there. So Billy Jewel, um, if you want to look for great ones, Black Remnant um, and Dark Fire Designs, Hokusa, but he's actually just paused his Patreon, and then Squamish, who's become David Chef models, Anvil Range, Anvil Rage, and there's, a, there's loads of others I've missed. But those guys all do Star Wars um, creatures. So if you want Star Wars for D&D, I've just named six, but there's, there's tons of us that have done it in the past and stopped, like Niverdale or Order 66, which I think is a Troxy Emporium. There's loads, and um, Blue Wolf, I think, do some. You know, there are so many people that do it that actually a few of them are dropping out. You know, so, someone like Black Remnant has three or 400 models. Skullforge, um, you know, the second it's out on Ahsoka, he'll have something out that week for it. You know, so there are people out there doing all of the characters. So it's not something I really feel there's a niche to go into that I would, um, you know, be able to get into. And I like what I do here. So 3D modelling. If you don't know anything about 3D modelling or you're just getting started, you've bought your first printer, you've printed some bought models or the ones that came with it, where do you go next? Well, the first thing I did personally was start getting loads of models off Thingiverse, which were free. Um, that was back before there were so many places. Now you've got places like Cults 3D and Thangs and Printables, and you can go and there's um, just so many search engines that will produce you hundreds and hundreds of 3D models. And I would go get a 3D model. Um, if you get them from some of the places like Cults 3D, sometimes you're getting game assets. And actually, one of my first ventures into characters was taking downloaded game assets, which are not printable because they're deliberately not printable um, because like hair is just not manifold. I'll explain that in a minute. So it's not printable. It's just a sheet and you need it to be like a string um, for hair. And, or it's too thin, it's not made to work. And working out how to make them printable. And that, to me, there was a huge learning curve about taking other people's files and either changing them or tweaking them, um, especially with game assets. So if I wanted a Lara Croft, um, you can get loads of game asset Lara Crofts in all of the main games. So then you can take your game asset one and move them. That was the end of the second video. So we're now on to what I did this week. So this is Wednesday and this is me kind of carrying on with Ben Quad for ages. Um, it's... It's an interesting, I think, journey to start with. Actually, I need to understand how other people's stuff works. Sometimes it's worth just going on Thingiverse and seeing what everybody else has done on how to make a file. So if I wanted to make a puzzle box, for example, say, and I probably won't, but say I wanted to do a holocron to go with, um, that's a Jedi thing that opens up with information inside, to go with my temples, just say, I wanted to do it. Um, you know, it was like a dice container or something, which was an idea I was playing with that probably won't do. Um, but you know, suppose I wanted to do that. I would actually go and look on Thingiverse first and see how everybody else has approached it, to see if it's opening, to see how they've made it. I wouldn't necessarily download those and um, use them, but I might go through and look just, did they do a ratchet? Has it a screw top? You know, there's loads of puzzle boxes I've printed in the past. Um, you know, how did they open? Is there something I could take from what I've seen? Oh, uh, obviously this was the, me now going off. And this is actually um, a good reminder. This is me trying to get this to print. And this is, um, Ben sent me the files for the Erebus shuttle. And he sent me them pre um, his final printability pass. So when I went to print them, um, I got them and they didn't, they didn't come down. I didn't look through this footage because there were 16 hours and I haven't edited it out yet. So you'll probably get loads of me just um, dumping stuff out and, um, and trying to get things into various different places. Um, but so this is me um, getting a print ready. Woohoo! I have exciting stuff that I put up here. I spend a lot of time though in um, Presser Slicer checking files. So it is part of my workflow quite a lot. So it's always open. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I, so I started with just trying to tweak files to get them to work. 
So I'd have a Lara Croft and I'd want her arms to go up so I could have her hanging off a um, branch. Or I'd want an Ahsoka. And when I did Ahsoka for the Clone Wars, she's holding a lightsaber. She just dropped a lightsaber and I had that in hand. And so I had to learn to do that for this. But most of what I do is hard surface modeling. And to get into it, you need to pick a program. Now, Blender is quite dense. It does a lot. It does sculpting. You'll see how slow it is because there'll be an awful lot of the churning rainbow wheel you get on a Mac as we get through this. Um, it, it really doesn't cope well once you get too many quads on there and too many vertices and whatever. It gets too much. And when you're sculpting, sometimes you need to go quite high definition. And I made the mistake with this of downgrading the definition on it quite early in the process. And then when I tried to pose them, it all distorted and I got some really weird stuff. So I've learned a lot doing Ben and I wouldn't do him this way. I've, I've learned a lot for the next one. Um, he's actually come out all right because I had to fix everything, but it meant I was fixing things I'd already sorted. So it's a journey getting with 3D modeling. And I don't think you start with, oh, I'm gonna make a, a pod racer like this. You don't start here. This is definitely not where you start. You start by making little things. Um, you know, some of the early stuff I made was something like an oil drum. It's actually quite simple, an oil drum. It's basically a cylinder with bits bumped out. And I made it in Fusion 360 and I did a loom and wrapped it. In Blender, I do it a completely different way um, because that's what I'm doing. And there's some basics you need to learn that are the same in most programs. So I think Luke Terran uses Tinkercad. People use Mesh Mixer. I like Blender. All of these are free programs that people use. I do recommend learning a free program if you're just getting started, rather than spending a lot of time trying to um, sort of pay money out for something that you may not actually enjoy 3D modeling. I mean, I was an accountant. I spent half my life on a computer before this, and I do love spending my time on a computer. I always have, I just, I could sit and spend my time playing on spreadsheets for hours. I love this type of stuff. So for me, I really enjoy doing this all day. I really do des enjoy designing all day. But if it's not your thing, don't choose perhaps something as complex as Blender if all you want to do is design, you know, quite simple objects that are mostly square. There we go. Let's go look at chat um, whilst I Look at me trying to do piggy little toes. Ah, I hope Stating's got his tea. Or is it coffee? Um, Monique, try changing to 3D modelling visualisation, but I swapped over as COVID hit and ended up being made redundant. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, I, I swapped into content creation and that sort of stuff as COVID hit. And it had an actual peak during COVID and then dropped off as soon as COVID ended. So, yeah. Uh, Bin, Binny Jewel. Oh, wow. I just went on Black Remnant and Dark Fire Designs. It's exactly what I needed to create the perfect campaign. Thank you. Uh, it's great. I, I support Dark Fire. I was also on Hokusa, who also does clones, who I love. And um, David Chef Designs now, if you're into the original trilogy, has some great stuff um, as well. So I really like him. He now does Kickstarters, but not in the Star Wars area. So great. Norm. How difficult is it to make character with move all appendages really simple in Blender? Um, and you'll see it, this gets posed by the end, uh, by the end of the week. Um, in fact, it was printable at the end of this. Uh, it's printing at the moment. I forgot to put it to go till um, earlier today. So it was a six hour print and it was still going when I looked earlier. It took me a while to get the room up to temperature. It has to be 25 degrees for that particular. Really simple though. Partly because I took this out and make human, um, what happened though? I took it out and make human and I only did one side, if you look at this. Um, so I've only ever fixed one side um, if I need to fix the hands or the face. And then I mirror it and smooth out in the middle where there's a join, which there normally is if it's a rounded shape. So because that's why I did it, I actually lost all the rigging from make human. But it, just quickly there, um, you saw I moved that. I actually did just move it. Sorry, it keeps blipping onto my desktop. Um, so yeah, um, very easy to rig. Because I've already got the rig in for this character from Make Human in exactly this right pose, though this is actually not a great pose. I think I put it in a T pose, but actually I think the standard Make Human pose with slightly dropped hands is actually better for posing a skeleton onto because um, it's got bends. But anyway, it comes out from Make Human and you can add a rig to it and it comes out with all the 
groups marked and everything really working well. So actually, it, it would have worked a lot better. So what I would do in future if I was doing human is use the make human and probably then add the head on separately. And if you look at dark fires, heads quite often they're a separate piece so you can pop them on and swap the heads or the helmets because they're clones and so you only have the body you don't have the head and so you can actually get rid of it and make it a lot easier um, but yeah this is me sculpting it I, 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 I'm not great and some of this is actually done with a mouse rather than a pen because I don't find myself that good at pens and I ended up using all sorts of weird stuff I'd never done before, which some of it worked and some of it didn't. So don't be surprised if you watch me do something and then you see the big screen that comes up with a big list of all the previous actions and I undo an hour's worth of work. Because the 16 hours that I spent doing this actually could have probably been eight for the next character. It's like each of my pod races is getting quicker as I move things forward. You know, I've done the base, so I just have to move forward. I've done all the connectors, all the stands, all the power couplings. I just have to move them into the next model and keep going. So I've learned so much. Um, there we go. Um, hey, Austin, have you ever tried Hero Forge character creation site, like D&D figure creation, good for beginners? Trouble is, I want to sell this. I can't sell their files. So what I'm doing, it's me undoing an hour's worth of work here. Um, what I'm doing is doing this for sale. So I know I can do characters because I've done them before. It's not where I want to spend all my time, but for something like this where I need a bespoke character, um, it's perfect. And the more you do it, the better you get. I'm, I've nothing against it. I just think that people like Dartfire do it far better than um, I would for actual figures like um, the clones and stuff. I'm, st I'm still trying to work out how to sculpt and get sharp edges. There's about an hour of this of me trying to get his coat when I sculpted it to look sharp and I could never get it to look sharp so in the end after two or three hours of doing stuff on it I went back and did it with a subdivision surface modifier and I, I started off with a circle and just did it with the vertices instead came out much quicker and much easier because that's what I'm used to doing so um, but yeah I can't sell Hero Forge stuff so for me it's it's great for other people I've seen some great stuff done with it but I just can't I just can't um, so James Pett says, I approve a blender. I really approve a blender. It's free and it is absolutely powerful. It's just sometimes too powerful and it's a steep learning curve. So if all you want to do is, is um, you know, things that are like buildings that are squares, you do not need something as powerful as blender. You can use blender. I do it for everything, but there's quite a learning curve to, to get to know blender because you really do need to know a lot of the shortcuts. Oh, it's on the menus, but there's just so much on the menus, it's finding stuff. And what you can't see, because I haven't got like the screencast keys enabled, is 99% of what I'm doing here is done on shortcuts. I'm not actually going down menus for most of this. I'm using Shift A to add something new, um, E to extrude, G to grab, R to rotate. I'm using X, Y, and Z if I know it wants to be on an axis. I'm putting O on and off for proportional editing. So whatever you decide to do, I would start with a simple program and, you know, something like Tinkercad, which Tamsin actually says, um, uh, I've used Tinkercad, but all I've been doing is some basic stuff with hard geometry. You know, Tinkercad is great for hard geometry. So, um, you know, uh, Richard says, I'm new to this and still learning. Thanks for the fab info, Cathy. Uh, happy to help when still got quite a lot more info to impart. Um, and then Vincent says, hello. Hi, Vincent. Stating, as a spreadsheet nerd, I approve this message. Coffee acquired, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> I love spreadsheets. I mean, I would design 3D models in them if I could, but yeah, I'm an Excel queen. Um, Samuel Beckett. Hi, KM. Hi, Mods. Hi, community. Apologies for being late. No YouTube notification. Oh, that's weird. I got one on an email when it went live. So why is there a model me here in Blender? <laughs> this is a face only a mother could love. Yeah, bless. Oh, bless him. I love him too. But I guess you could say I'm his mother because I produced him. That's weird. Let's not go there. Emery Sahin. Um, 3D wave model can be a very good commercial idea to create a cellular wave effect in epoxy works because not everyone is successful in creating a sea wave effects in epoxy works. Yeah, um, I think one of the... Uh, um, one of the things that I sell is something that you're going to print at home. And so... Um, if 
I would sell terrain that people use for tabletop games because that's where there's a market. And if I could do waves for that, I probably would. But at the moment, I'm, sand dunes is what I've actually done. These bases, and I did these using the pen and it cramped my hand like mad because I haven't used a pen in years. These bases are actually sand dunes. Perhaps if I had the smaller one, that actually has a lot less on it. So you can see, these are sand dunes. So that is really simple. That was like a few hours work. Um, so, um, right. Bill, do you ever start with a 3D mesh model and modify it? For instance, you create a model using LiDAR to scan a little figure, then customize it. That's a really good question, and I've never got it to work. So I tried a couple of years ago, photogrammetry, using your phone, all sorts of things to scan a model. And there wasn't enough mesh density on the small size of models that I had to create a good model. I was trying it for um, a, actually it's about this big, the figure from Halo. He's one of the bad guy brutes whose name is totally escaping me at the moment. Um, the one out of Halo Wars 2. Anyway, I had a, a big model of him, but I wanted to change his armor to make him into a different brute, the one from Halo Infinite. And so just changed the model arm around and I had him, so I thought, you know, I'll scan him. I tried everything and I've got a Mac, so half the photogrammetry programs didn't work on a Mac. The phone never produced anything decent enough mesh without having to pay, which I didn't really want to do. And I think it's come on a long way and now you can get a lot better. But I've got to say, I wasn't that impressed. So no, I haven't. What I would do is actually I go and look on someone like Colt 3D. If I'm doing something for a diorama, not for, for me to sell, but if I'm doing something from a diorama, I'd go and look on Colt 3D and find something similar and adapt that. So Monique says, we were using 3DS Max in the office. The switching to Blend after learning on an Autodesk product was quite hard. Yeah, I, I think there's a bit to say about, I really think like Blender. Blender has vertices, edges, and faces. But most people who do this kind of sculpting use ZBrush, which is a voxel, I think. I get very confused between all the different sorts. It's more of a voxel one, so it does a lot of detail. If I want to put the detail to put a pattern on that, um, if I put a pattern on those trousers, by the time I've got enough mesh density to get the pattern on, Blender is unhappy. Uh -uh, and then if I want to move it, I actually deleted this down way too early in mesh density. And then when I came to pose it, it distorted and twisted because I'd gone non-quad by that point. So there's definitely um, something about um, I'm learning. Uh, but what I think Blender is a learning point and everybody has to decide which one suits them. If you're doing um, hard surface and you're going to be doing a lot of very CAD, I've got a, a blueprint I want to follow, then Fusion 360 may suit you better. If you want to do what I do, which is a mix of sculpting and hard surface, then Blender is, I think, better. Um, Norm, would pod races have more cushy bottoms and longer legs? Uh, I have no idea about whether their bottoms are cushy. They're all alien. Each one of them is different. Uh, this one is based off the film, and I've actually got a big book here that's um, The Chronicles, and it's got the CGI picture sort of front and side for each of the characters. So that's what I based it on. So actually, now we've mentioned that, um, so when I start with 3D modeling, the first thing you need for a good 3D model is a good reference. It's the same for any modeling. So if you do any modeling at all, you'll want good references. So I've been creating Maul's Scimitar. Um, I, I, I had it and I spent, um, ooh, and I did it over Christmas. It was just a bit of fun over Christmas because like when you design for 3D printing for your living, what do you do at Christmas? Oh, let's just design something else for 3D printing. Um, so anyway, I designed Maul Scimitar and then I've still got the legs to do, the sort of landing gear and it's it's done but it's it's spot on bob on accurate so it, i'm not sure whether i'll ever sell it or not but it was a personal project anyway um and and i didn't think about printability too much when i was doing it so there's a few things that don't orient well so the first thing you need for 3d printing is really good reference photos what is it that you actually want to um sort of 
produce. Have you got a blueprint for it? So if I look at these pod races, I'm looking for 20% difference. So I've just got a picture and I'm doing it off a picture. And if it's not quite right, I don't want it to be quite right. Mall Scimitar, when I did that, and it's the ship from The Phantom Menace, you see it in about four seconds worth of screen time. It's a really cool ship. It's in some of the comics and it's in the books. And I, you know, it's a great ship in the books. Feels a lot bigger in the books than it is when you actually try and model it and you realize things like it's got a sphere on the back and actually you are, you can't even get two people standing up you can, they can only really stand up in the middle so especially if they've got bases on so you look at it and you go I know more was short but for him to have all of that seating plus six other seats around the back which is what it says is there not a lot of space anyway um I started off searching for um blueprints now I have a book of Star Wars blueprints I have a vehicles book which has um like uh, cutouts and I also have the chronicles the prequels chronicles which is on my desk all the time at the moment um actually if I move all of these they're sat on it and um, on the floor my floor is for the pod races I was printing them all at 0.16 and then printed at 0.1 so I have two of most of them but I was finding the 0.1 didn't support quite the same so this is my reference book for the prequels and just so you know, that is Ben Quadraneris's little section there, the bottom half of that. It's not very big, um, so you spend a lot of time squinting. And you also have to spend an awful lot of time um, just searching the internet. So I searched the internet and then I found more scimitar in here, which had some views. And what I found on the internet was I could get blueprints for top down and side but I couldn't get bottom or I think I could there was one direction I couldn't get I think it was side couldn't get a decent side view and Maul has quite a weird shape on his ship and um, there's a circle at the back and it's pointy at the front and and in the end I bought the Hasbro toy from the Phantom Menace from 2003 or 4 because it's, it's actually 20 years 25 years old today so it came out in 99 but it was from 03 or something the the toy I, I got that toy so actually I'm going to see the Phantom Menace on May 3rd at our local um cinema because they're re-releasing it it's 25 years old I'm not sure I even saw it at the cinema the first time around 25 years old hard to believe it was out last century shocking so anyway it's it's quite a few years ago now so anyway 25th and um it was, what can I say? Um, doing more scimitar without one angle was really hard. So the first thing you need to do when you're 3D printing is get good references. If you can get th all three angles, side, top, bottom, front, back, then you'll be able to model anything and make it spot on. And you'll be able to line up your views in Blender uh, or whatever program you're using and get really good. So if you're getting a building and you want to produce a building, um, you want to know how big it is, you can count bricks. You know, there's all sorts of ways you can size things. So you get your model. In my case, I know that a mall symmetry is 26.5 metres long because that is a known fact and is written in about 20 different places. It's actually, I feel like it should be longer. I actually feel like that's a bit short. When you come to put people into it, you go, I know more short, but he doesn't actually fit. Um, but yeah, you, you, you have this sort of known amount so you can scale it. And then you can just create your um, figure starting um, in 3D. And then that's when you have to learn your 3D program to really understand the best way to do it. It normally starts with a cube, a cylinder or a um, sphere, depending what you're doing. So most of these started with a cube. You saw there some of them started with a cylinder. Uh, when I was doing his main body, it started with a sphere because he's rounded top and bottom. And this is me trying to do it with sculpting. I gave up. This is there's quite a lot of footage of me doing something which I then got rid of because I couldn't get it smooth enough. Just just for me, personally, I, I don't mind a bit of movement. It makes it look like cloth, but somehow it just didn't seem to catch the fact he's a CGI character and he was a bit smoother. So there we go. Um, Norm, uh, this is back in chat. I was kidding, but maybe if they evolve. 
It's fascinating, but humans can't do it unless you're called Anakin. So I've got to make sure they're all aliens, which isn't very helpful. And some of them are really small aliens, so it's going to be bespoke for each of the pod races. Um, you know. Uh, Binny Jaw, the amount of work you put into this is amazing. Uh, this is actually, um, yeah, it, it, you get quicker, I think, the more you do it. And I think that is... Um, you know, that's one of the key things there, that it, whatever you are doing, do not expect to go into 3D modeling and be good at it. I started this in 2018 and I do it full time now. So that's only five years of perhaps learning Blender, but I've spent my whole life on a computer. So, you know, there are people who come out of school now who have learned graphic design and 3D design from school and they're just miles ahead of me. A lot of the people who do minis for market, they all came out of either the game industry or 3D design somewhere as a job. So they're all really good at it because this has been their full-time job. Um, whereas for me, it's been a hobby in the past and I'm learning. So to be fair, for, for what this mini is gonna be as a little pilot, he's gonna be cute and he's gonna work fine. Um, and there's actually a danger of he's only about this big they're not, to, he's, the, the people doing pod racing, most of the aliens are actually quite small aliens. They're not really tall. When you look at their pod racers and you look at the actual sizes of them. Oh, back to chat. Um, Monique says, I saw the original Star Wars in a movie theater, Kelly, that ages you. Um, it probably ages me. Uh, was it 78 it came out? I could have seen it at the cinema, but I didn't. I remember watching it when it came on TV in the UK for the first time, which I think was early 80s. And that's when I remember watching it. But I didn't go to the cinema much as a kid. I hardly went at all. I think the only ones that I have seen at the cinema when they first came out were probably the sequels. Because that's just... And I go through phases. Some years I go to the cinema. Had a Cineworld pass for years. So of the last 10 years, pre-lockdown, I probably went every week for, you know, a couple of years. But I've had decades of my life where I haven't been to the cinema at all. Even though I'm into movies, sci-fi, I just wouldn't have gone to the cinema. Just, just never went. Um, so there we go. But Norm says you're not alone, Monique. And I suspect it's quite a few people here that will fess up to it. Tim, I keep having that. Is that really the that old experience for a lot of things? Pretty sure I saw Phantom Menace at the cinema the week it came out. One of the few times I remember being allocated a seat. Uh, you, yeah, I don't remember. But it was always allocated seating. Um... For my local cinema even if it was half empty um around the time that would have been coming out that was um the uci doesn't even exist anymore since they built touchwood um <laughs> i think um russ rockin says boomer Mike. um right stating the obvious saw episode four in the cinema that star destroyer went on forever yeah i mean somebody on um my discord Oh, who was it? Oh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Um, somebody's going to see all nine across May 4th weekend in a row. I'm just like, when do you go to the loo? Do they have breaks? Do you eat? It's 20 hours, apparently. I watched, I actually watched The Phantom Menace and the other prequels um, only a few weeks ago. So, um, but um, I have to say, uh, they're, they're okay. I dislike so much about the prequels. I love all the TV series and the books that go alongside them, not the actual book of um, Revenge of the Sith, but I really like that era. It's my favourite era in Star Wars because it has Jedi. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, the Acolyte coming out June 4th, I think it is. Um, and that's a live action, not done on the volume. It's funny, people are looking at going, you can see how Star Wars fans love to hate. There's a huge sort of series of comments going, you can tell it was done on the volume. It looks so poor. And it's like I chatted to one of the cameramen when he came to borrow some of my terrain for something. It's none of it is done on the volume. It's all done on stage, sound set or outside. So when people start saying, oh, it was done on the volume. I don't like it. The CGI looks rubbish. You can tell it's all just fake. They're just hating on it because they love to hate. Don't believe Star Wars fans. Everything's cancelled and not going to happen according to them. But the other thing they advertised was recently was Tales of Empire, which is, um, they've done Tales of the Jedi, which has some great Dooku and Ahsoka stories. 
Um, but they also did Tales of the Jedi, um, Tales of the Empire coming out, and that's got Barris Offay. And if you've seen the Clone Wars, you'll remember her from that. She has a good arc in it, and it'll be interesting to see what happens to her. So, um, Samuel Beckett at Monsville. I'd imagine we're all about the same ages. Vague recollection of episode four release, but definitely clearly remember the rumor of groundbreaking revelation of DV and LSW confirmation in episode five. There we go. Uh, Tamsin says, I think the first was 78 for the UK. I think I looked it up to see. I wouldn't, have, I was six then. I wouldn't have been, no, I was actually five, probably when it came out. I wouldn't have been going to the cinema really to see it anyway. Uh, even though if we had gone to the cinema, we would have, it would have been the sort of thing we'd have gone and seen because my mum loves it. So Monique says 1977, but I don't think it's out at the same time at every single country. I think America gets used to, in those days, get everything six months to a year earlier. So, you know, it was like TV series could be decades almost before they came out in the UK. Um, even Mandalorian, um, Disney Plus didn't launch here. So Grogu, or Baby Yoda, totally spoiled everywhere. Everything totally spoiled by the time the rest of the world got it outside of the US and maybe Canada. I think Germany had it before us. Um, so yeah, just, you get used to it. Um, Russ rocking O and HO trains and stuff. 77 in the US, I was in the seventh grade, yeah. It was definitely 78 in the UK, I think, because I looked it up quite recently. <gasps> Samuel Beckett, I've been to the cinema since Avatar. So disappointed. I didn't actually like Avatar that much and I watched the newest one recently and I'm still like not that much um, but um, I think you know I used to love Marvel up to Lane Game I think that was my favourite um, Marvel but I haven't really I've just not really been yeah so um, Tamlin says just checked IMDB December 27th 1977 I probably saw it in January 78 yeah, I think most people would have. So actually in January 78, I would have been four still because I would have turned five that year. So I definitely didn't see it. But I remember it coming out on TV and getting very excited and making my dad buy a little TV for the canal boat um, for that. And I think it was 82 to 84, somewhere around there. Um, Bill, after having good references, what is the second most important thing when it comes to 3D modelling? Uh, it's a good question. So for everybody who's saying they saw it in... Um, 1977 in the US um, if it came out December 27th in the US as well I suspect you didn't all get to see it in 77 a lot of you went to see it in 78 but it might come out six months earlier there because it's just the way it worked uh, so after references back to 3D modeling which is what I'm supposed to be talking about um, after references it is about picking your program and learning it so 3D modeling is all about having the, the right program for you. You can see I'm doing this in Blender. I, I used to use Fusion 360 and Blender, but just little things like panning and moving and orbiting and all of the different move things are different between the two. And when I first started on Blender, it was really hard. It was right click to select. And they did a massive UI update to 2.8, which changed everything. And it became much more user friendly. Up till then, it had been quite a dense program. You had to know the shortcut. And it was really hard to learn. Then they did a UI update and it became a, a lot simpler to learn. And now if you want to move around, you there's like five or six different ways to move whether it's using the mouse, whether it's using different buttons on the mouse, whether it's using the um, thing that you can see moving all the time that's red, green and blue, that's the, you can actually click on that to change direction, whether it's using the number pad. So, you know, it is about learning the basics of your program. How do I add a basic shape? How do I manipulate that basic shape? What are the controls? What are the shortcuts? Because if you're gonna 3D model, you'll want to know some of the basics. How do I grab it? How do I rotate it? How do I scale it? And in Blender, how do I extrude it? As in, expand it by adding another face moved out. Um, how do I scale in a certain direction? Where do I put the center of it? Because um, the center is very important. Where does it pivot around? How do I select it? Um, you know, what are the shortcuts that I might need to learn? Some of the things that I use a lot in Blender are add-ons. 
Now Blender is free, but there are paid add-ons you can put onto it. And there are add-ons included in Blender that are not enabled off the bat. So basic vanilla Blender is actually quite basic for a lot of things. Personally, I have about eight to 10 add-ons and some of them I wouldn't live without. Um, ones I always recommend, I think included is Loop Tools, which I have going, um, but the 3D Print Toolbox, which helps you find manifold issues. To be fair, since Christmas, I had a problem with one of the pod races. I couldn't get it to go manifold and Blender was saying it's manifold and Presser Slicer was saying it wasn't. And I didn't know what to do. And I used to dump them up to Lychee sometimes and fix them there, but it wasn't fixing it and nothing was happening. And I, I, people use Netfab, but there isn't a Netfab option for a Mac. And Tamsin had been doing all of my Netfabbing and she did a bunch for me when I was stuck with this one and sent it back. But I can't, when I'm designing full time, doing maybe 20 iterations or something, keep dumping them out to Tamsin and going, Tamsin, would you mind just Netfabbing this for me? Because she has a PC and Netfab works on the PC, but the Mac doesn't work anymore. And now it's an Autodesk product, you can't use it easily. They, they basically got rid of the free version. But I found another website, um, Formware, as you'd expect it to be spelled, F-O-R-M-W-A-R-E, like form and software, but formware.co. You can load stuff up there and it fixes them and it's miraculous and it's really good. It'll do up to 50 meg files as long as they take less than four minutes and it has fixed everything. And I just, I use it all the time. Sometimes you have a queue of 63 because it's free. Sometimes there's like nothing queuing. And I think when America comes online, obviously there's more people doing things. So you might get a bit more. They're based in Amsterdam, but it's, it's cool. I wouldn't be without it. Absolutely recommend it for fixing files. If you've got Netfab, it's fine. But if you're like me, you've got a Mac and you can't use it, it's brilliant. So all of these meshes, I used to spend a lot of time in Blender going and using the 3D print toolkit to fix it. So once you've got it and you've learned some basic shortcuts, you've learned the basics of how to manipulate it. If you think, well, Cathy uses Blender, so I want to go and do Blender. For that, it's a pro it, most programs will tell you how to render because Blender was originally set up for um, not 3D printing, for producing things, for rendering for games. So I would definitely recommend, totally recommend the donut course. It's by Blender Guru, I think it is, the YouTube channel. But if you were to type the donut course in, you'll find it. Millions and millions of people have done the, the donut course. I'm not joking. It is the number one course for starting Blender that everybody gets recommended. Everybody has to do their donut. It's like a rite of passage. So go off and do your donut. And it may be for rendering, but he will show you how to um, move around the workspace, how to um, manipulate things. If then like me, you want to do hard surface modeling in sci-fi, I um, I think they've just changed their format a bit, but they do have a lot of free stuff on YouTube as well. The Blender Brothers, blenderbros.com, um, do an awful lot of really good courses. They've now got Hard Surface Academy and it's a, they've moved different pan and they were talking, I saw these emails about them taking the old standalone courses off, but I did their hard surface, some of their basic modeling courses, and they were really accessible and really good. And they recommended a lot of add-ons and they're the ones I generally use. So I had, I've got add-ons. So you, for, for Blender, I would recommend you need the 3D print toolbox. It's included loop tools. I've also got Mesh Machine, which is free. Machine Tools. One of those is free and one isn't. I think Machine Tools and Mesh Machine, one's free, one isn't. And then I, or maybe it's just become like $5 minimum. I think his free one has become now, um, but they're excellent. I use them all the time. And the shortcuts I use from them are just really good shortcuts. Still trying to get this to print. This is the next version up. You saw that about an hour ago when I was last trying to sort it. And um, it's great. I really um, use that a lot. And the other one is hard ops. Um, I, I have box cutter. I hardly use it. I have decal machine, hardly use it. And, but, Hard ops I use all the time. I use Cablerator to do my cables. It makes really quick work of doing cables. And I've also got on PowerSave, which is um, something which does version control and just adds it on and backs it up. And I, 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 power sa I mean, I save every two minutes. So if it crashes or if it just becomes a loop of too long, so it crashes for ages, 
then I can easily um, just go back and it will have saved something from two minutes earlier and I can just go back and find it on an auto recover. So some way of backing it up. So that's what you really, really want is um, something really important is you know your backups, learning your basics, getting going. And then you need to start doing projects. Um, I, I did mention that I left this going for about three hours one night. And I'm just going to speed through this because I think I'm now in, there we go. That might be the three hours I left it going. So here we are, back on. Um, so um, I really, I really can't emphasize that you need to start small and work your way up. So one of the first things I did was my oil drums for, I mean, I had oil drums, but I did them for a video, um, an early video for Model Railroader, um, I think, MRVP, and I did them on there. You, you can then start learning all sorts of things with the basics. Um, you'll have your donut, you can 3D print your donut. Um, you might want to use it early on, learn how to use booleans to slice stuff up to fit on your print bread. So if you've got an FDM printer, um, the, and I, I've got this, say I've got this loath cat to print, which is a Tuka cat, it's a Star Wars cat effectively. And I haven't printed it, but it was something I meant to do and never got around to. It's about this big, you know. My print bed will actually do about that big, but it won't do that big. So I need to cut it up to fit it on. And as print beds get bigger, this becomes less of an issue. But the easiest way to do it is to use a Boolean cut. Um, and I Boolean everything. I mean, I Boolean all the time. I'm a huge Booleaner. And basically what Booleans are, are a way of cutting and combining two objects into one. So if I... Um, on this face here, I cut out the centre of that face using another shape into the um, circle, the sphere that I had, using a shape that I'd made that was the right shape for his face. I did that with a Boolean. In Blender, it's really simple. You just go in and do, especially if you've got all the add-ons enabled, Control minus and it will cut it. You select them both, Control minus it will cut it, Control star will um, uh, in, add it and then Control plus will union them. So you can spend a lot of time doing all sorts of very exciting things with Booleans and I live on my Booleans. So there's a lot to be said about getting confident on small projects, learning those basics. Perhaps, you know, you start with your oil drum, you've got a full oil drum. For your second oil drum, you want to do a hollow oil drum. Now you could hollow that out very simply in the mesh um, or you could decide I'm going to use a Boolean to, to hollow it out and I'm going to learn how to do a Boolean and do it that way. So, you know, there's a lot to be learnt building up over time. So, uh, right, back to chat whilst I'm doing this. Norm, US was 77, so apparently it was 1st of May 77. So this is it. When people get into arguments on the internet, I often just find it's because they're in a different country. Um, like, people will write and tell me all the time, I said there was a Jeep on Jurassic Park. And they, people will write from the US and tell me it wasn't a Jeep, it was a Ford Explorer. And I'm just like, actually in the UK, a Jeep is any four wheel drive. So for me, it's a Jeep. It might not be for you, but for me, it's a Jeep because Jeeps, I had a friend that owned one, but they're not a car you see around here at all. Nobody really buys them. So for us, Jeeps are something the Americans came over, four wheel drive, they're just called a Jeep if they're off-roaders. So, you know, it's a Jeep. And that, both of us are right. I mean, the fact, People think that they want to write and correct you on the internet always amuses me, um, you know, but it gets great engagement for um, YouTube if people write and correct me. So I generally don't complain, but I do write back and just say, well, I'm British and that's what we call them. Um, so, you know, it's fascinating how um, you can have these discussions with people and it just turns out it's a different country thing. Monique. I've never gotten into Marvel. It seems a bit silly having superheroes in our world. Star Wars is a completely different universe and so more believable to my black and white mind. See, I love superheroes and I love the idea of, I, I was brought up on a mix of sci-fi and fantasy. So I, I don't really care which universe they're supposed to be in. Um, I just really like anything. But I think we've overdone the superheroes at the moment. I'm feeling like there's too many superheroes and we could do with just going back to having decent heroes. Um, 
Having a good machine is very important too, says Russ. It is, I've now hit the problem that my old MacBook Pro, which I've had since 2014, so it's 10 years old, won't load the latest Blender because it won't, it won't do the latest Blender and it won't do the latest Mac upgrade and it won't do the latest Lightroom. So I've now got different versions between my two machines and I hadn't upgraded it to the latest Blender it would do. I think I was a version old. And the, what I was opening there on this machine in my house wouldn't open on the MacBook Pro that was around at Mum's. So yeah, I, I need to buy a new one, but I'm just waiting for the next Kickstarter to get the money in um, before I do. But yeah, it's, um, it's definitely good. I put extra RAM in. Macs aren't great in some ways because for rendering, they have they don't have a graphics processing unit in the same way as a PC. So they can be a bit sucky on the rendering, but I think the newer stuff that Apple's brought out has been a lot better at that. Um, Dual 21, I tried Blender with an Apple Magic Mouse and it was murder to move without a scroll wheel. Um, oops, oh dear, you all disappeared. Let me try and do this. So this is my mouse. You will need one of these for Blender. It is a wired, because I prefer wired mouse because they're less, middle mouse button with a wheel. You need a middle mouse with a wheel. The other thing you need for Blender is a number keyboard. If you don't have these two things, you will suck at Blender. So my top tip for Blender is get yourself a middle mouse wheel. They're like eight quid wired on, and this one does LED lights as well. Um, not that I ever put them on. Um, but you know, get yourself a middle mouse wheel button thingy off um, Amazon or wherever you go, other you know stockists do exist. They're like eight quid and I've got a spare one because sometimes this one gets a bit dicky. But yeah, have them just, yeah, can't do Blender without. Um, and the Apple, I mean, I hardly use my Apple mouse now. Um, I use it more like a trackpad. Um, but you do need a number keyboard as well. You can't really use Blender without a number keyboard because all of the view alignment is on the number keyboard. So get yourself, I end up buying a new keyboard. I mean, if you've got a PC, you may have it anyway. But I always use the Mac keyboard over my MacBook Pro one. I put another keyboard on top. And yeah, if you don't have those two things, you won't get Blender to work, I'm afraid. Um, Stating the obvious, Battlestar Galactica film was 1978 too. Yep, and I am sure I probably watched it. Ironically, that big screen movie was me dumping out of Blender because I'd done something that had taken so long I just crashed out of it and recovered it. So yeah, sometimes I just crash Blender out when it gets stuck. Um, okay, it's a, Samuel Beckett asked, do you use a 3D left-hand puck for view manipulation in addition to the keyboard shortcuts and mouse? No, I use my mouse for view manipulation. I just use the mouse. It uses a lot of the middle mouse button to do the moves. And then I use the keyboard for the shortcuts, but I've just got the mouse. Um, I, I've i never used two-handed control. I don't even feel the need for it because I find, I mean, I've got the pen. I bought myself a little tablet, 25 quid XP pen one. I bought a Wacom one, it didn't work. It was my second Wacom one that didn't work, so it went back and the XP pen just worked. It's fine, I can use it, it's fine using a pen, I'm just not used to using it anymore. But I am so actually almost as good with a mouse as I am with a pen, because I just use it all. Um, Monique says, constant saves are a mess with all design software. The other thing is, when I bring up my undo history, you can see it fills the whole page. I think it's set at about 250 or something. Make sure if you can adjust the number of undos that you have, that you want it out as long as you can almost. Yes, you'll need extra memory for it, but when you want to go back 250, because the whole last hour was just a dead end, you can go back you know, 250 because the whole last hour was a dead end. And I did that four or five times while doing this dude. So yeah, definitely make sure you have a longer undo history. Eight is not enough. Um, Jaw 21, I did the donut course, but I've but forgotten it all. Have you seen Blender Guru's The Shining Elevator scene? It's mind blowing. I'm not sure, I, I think I saw him starting it, but I don't think I've seen the end result. A lot of what he does is mind blowing because he just creates scenes in minutes almost. He's really talented. Ah, Dillington, excellent. Uh, he does some beautiful little videos, does Dillington with his grandson. Evening, Kathy, and everyone else managed to get here better late than never. Definitely better late than never. Um, so there we go. Those people saying hello to him. 
Uh, Russ Rocking, no argument, just a nice discussion, Cathy. I don't even know what we're talking about. Having a good machine, yeah. Um, yeah, I often do crash blender when I, you'll see by the end of this. So Friday or Saturday, I think it was, I'd put too much um, geometry on. I got too many vertices and this was saving out at somewhere like 100 meg. And you really want your files to be a lot smaller. So I decimated them all. And then when I came to pose it, I had problems. So there are modifiers you can do that add on extra geometry. And what you'll see is at the moment, this guy in the middle, the, the guy who's skin colored in this, has loads of geometry, he looks really good. But every now and then you'll see he doesn't look as good. He's down to just some basic lines. And that's where I've taken the modifier off um, that has the smoothing effect and adds in extra geometry that I basically also use while sculpting. It's a sculpt, I don't even understand how it works. It's a multi-res modifier and it's the first time I've ever used it. It does quads, and but you can't see it to manipulate the vertices. It's not there. I find it really weird. But anyway, um, I, I take it off so it's quicker. Um, on the viewport and it's still there for sculpt mode so it's still there but um, it just isn't there when I come to do it for viewport and then you put it on when you've done the pose and everything um, but it just makes it look weird because actually when it's on he shrinks a little bit in size so he fits in his clothing and when it's off his butt hangs out oh, it's just one of those things um, so John Gaines, I'm tad confused why you're using a subdivision modifier instead of multi-resolution for sculpting, but okay. Okay, so there's two types of um, way of doing things, John. And I had never used a multi-resolution before. Um, I'd used subdivision because I do hard surface. And when you're doing hard surface, subdivision is easier to manipulate because I can see it in the edit if I want. I can't see multi-resolution ever in the vertex um, view. And so all of what I'd, um, I'd done in the past have been subdivision. So for this, uh, I learned a lot. I had to use multi-resolution. But then if I wanted to go and just sharpen one set of vertices in um, like his collar, I couldn't because multi-resolution only shows in sculpt mode. It's there, but when I take it off, it just disappears. The sculpting disappears. So it's really weird. I found it a very bizarre thing to use and I don't sculpt much will be the problem. But what I do find is when I've been doing sub D um, where I, I've used it in the past, when I'm doing a um, sculpting in the past, I put sub D on and dim topo. So I've only ever used in topo, but it just only puts extra where you need it. So one of my problems with a lot of stuff is I might put a sub D on just to get a certain amount of um, geometry. So when you're sculpting, you need geometry to sculpt. If you were to take this, this is a basic glove and this was a dead end. I did it a different way in the end. But here was me trying to shrink wrap this, took me an hour, went nowhere, onto his fingers. And with that amount of geometry, you can't get very good because each face only distorts as a face. You know, it can only move that face like this. Whereas if you've got that face split into 20 faces, it can move all 20 of them and it can get a different effect. So I think it's because I come out of hard surface modeling and I actually just had always use sub D. But because I wanted this to be quad based and posed, I did multi-resolution for the first time. And I found it weird, I really did. Um, but I do need to look a lot more because normally um, I use a texture and I used in topo and I only put the additional texture on where I need it to be so I'll have to go and work out whether multi-resolution or sub D is the best way to do that in future having now done it but one of the things that I miss with multi-resolution is the ability to then go and look in the um, vertex mode and see it so there we go um, and then, but no, it's a, it's a really good question, John, because I have up till now used sub D for sculpting because I've been doing textures 
more than sculpting, if that makes sense. So I would produce my building and I would have it to a certain level and then I'd add a sub D, but then I would didn't topo my texture on because displacement mapping doesn't really work because of having different normals and things. So I would then, and also I want a bit more variety. So I would go on and add it having used the sub D. So I will need to go back and just work out whether a multi-res modifier would have been a better thing to do. So learning curve, John, as you say. Um, so, but you then say creasing and such yepperoni. So yeah, that, that is basically my problem. So as a hard surface modeler, I'm, I'm, this is making no sense to anybody unless you've done it. And um, there are many ways you can sculpt. I'm a hard surface modeler. I'm used to doing um, boxes and squares and distorting them. And maybe I'll put a subdivision modifier on. And what that does is it smooths everything out and sucks it in and puts curves on. So if you want to do a curve shape, if you want them to have sharp edges, um, like my sleds, uh, are all done with hard surface and sub D, and maybe a couple of subdivision surfaces in, it adds in extra geometry so I get smoother curves. So instead of getting blocky curves, like this one here, where the multi-resolution modifier's not on, it's very blocky, the fingers, when I put it on, they go smooth. It, it's about learning the best way to do your program. When you start out, you will probably just use a square and a cube it's when you want to add textures that really this become esoteric discussion becomes relevant. Um, so Bill, many mods that I download from FreeSite you mentioned earlier can be printed right away. Do you have any tips for fixing models for others? For instance, the STL format. So first of all, um, fixing models can be a bit of a headache. If you get a non-manifold model from Thingiverse, the first thing I would do is show it through Netfab or this formware.co that I've been recommending. So, um, you know, you just show it through there and it will get rid of most of the issues if it's not printing. Um, if it's really bad, find a different model is my top tip. There are some on Thingiverse that are never going to really work. There are some that you're will flag with errors, but your printer will still just print them fine. So it's worth looking at them to see what prints. Um, but some of them are just so bad that it's a good way to learn to fix, but starting with an SDL is really difficult. If you look at all this, this is all in edge, it's all in quad mostly, and it's all in edge rings, and just this is really bad modelling by the way. I put it up to show you what not to do. I was tired, I've been doing it for four, you know eight hours by this point, and I was just really tired and I was fed up, and I was just trying to shrink wrap a glove. The, the way I did it in the end, is, was a two minute job. This was not. And you know, when you're doing clothing, you often shrink wrap so it fits the figure and then you kind of wide, widen it back out again to have the curves and whatever. Um, so yeah, this is not good modeling. Um, does his hoodie have built-in goggles? I don't know what those are. I never worked it out. It has these little round things that are clear, but he doesn't put them over his face. And they don't look like goggles from the side views. So I just had them as like clear things stuck on. Goodness knows. Um, but I'd never thought of them as goggles. I, I wish I'd thought of that before I did him, but he's done now. So, you know, they, they will come down somehow. We just, I have no idea how. I never thought of that. I just feel like being so dumb. Um, has anyone combined AI rendering and 3D modeling? I'm sure they have. Um, I'm mixed views on whether AI is good or not. I use it on Photoshop for backgrounds of like sci-fi, but I'm not a fan. Uh, this is the second version. I just took the existing mesh, duplicated it, moved the ends, and that was it. It was done in a matter of seconds. So this is why I say you have to learn your programs. This took like two or three minutes. And if I've been thinking from the start, this is the way I'd have done it from the start. It is always worth learning the, that there's more than one way to do something. And sometimes there's the long way and then there's the short way. But you can see at the moment, I've got the multi-res um, modular um, thing off. This is what this model actually looks like without all of the different things that can be adapted to it um, that you do through things called modifiers in Blender. And so, you know, there we go. Um, wow. Digger, 
Sorry guys, been here a while, but chat wasn't working for me. Well, it's nice to have you, Digger. Digger's one of my moderators, but um, don't need to confess you were late. Just blame the computer. We all believed you. Um, so nice to have you there. Um, so um, let's just recap where we've got to. Now Digger's here in chat. Um, so for 3D modeling, first of all, you need to start small. Um, get great reference photos. If it involves buying a few books, if you have, I have a lot of art books, um, but there's a lot of concept art and other models. Um, you know, if you want to know how to do Swink, find a free version of Swink Similar and go look how they did it. If you want to know structurally, if you can't work out how to get your connectors to work, I asked John Games and he gave me the answer to that. Um, so thank you, John, for fixing my connector problem. It's really hard to clip in small sizes and it wasn't working and John, gave me some advice, which is really good. He's very good at fixing engineering and printability. Um, in fact, I don't know, John, if you were on earlier when we missed me trying to print um, Ben's before he'd done his printability pass. Um, so I had all the stuff the wrong way around on the cryotube lids. Um, but what I would say, do your prints. I, I dive to the detail. So there's a whole philosophy about how you actually model 3D prints. And the first thing you have to do is block it out. So what I do, um, let's use this small one as an example. I have an engine and it's got front pieces, it's got back pieces, it's got connectors and it's got a sled. I mocked out the six or seven basic shapes that make up all of, in fact, I, I mocked it out first of all with a, a rectangle at the back for the sled, um, a cylinder for the front one and another side cylinder um, for the side one. There may even have been um, spheres, I think, that I just cut the front off to get the curve shape. And I, I did that, I blocked it out for sizing. So all my um, pod races have been sized. Though actually I might do some different ones in the end because people keep saying, oh, I really like this guy. And I'm like, okay, let me know which ones you want and I'll do them. Um, I, I've got the four that I know I need to do. And Anakin's next. Um, and then I'm open for suggestions for the last two. Um, and then I've got another two to do as well. But I, I look at this and um, then after you've done a big, you know, very simple block out for sizing, make sure everything fits on the base, you know where you're gonna go. I then mock in the big block items. So for this engine, I mocked in the side piece, you know, the little side booster. I mocked in that I needed a strut. I already had my power couplers and connectors from a previous one, so I was able to just append those and um, make sure they all lined up. I mocked in where I wanted this piece to be, the rough size of it in this direction, this direction, you know, this size. I put it all together and I've got pictures. I've got quite a lot of pictures of it in all angles. And I went through and it's not identical because I don't want it to be identical, but I then worked out what I wanted. When I got it roughed out, I then go through and get it more or less to where I want it to be. I then add in surface detail this part has actually got um, loads and loads of um, sort of lines in it. So I did those, those are slices, but to get them to print, I just overlap them a little bit with the vertices afterwards. So they're slices and I put a bevel on them to get it. I add on cable detail. I add in, um, you know, just markings. So there's a, a stripe on it. Um, there's markings on the sled, which I have to add in. The sled's all curves. That's all just done with, actually, if you look at the base model, it's hardly got any mesh to it at all. It's mostly, I think it's got four or five on the sub Ds, which adds loads of extra geometry, but it's not actually there. And so it creates lovely sweeping curves just by dint of a modifier. I don't even have to do that much. All I have to do is select my sharp edges for the base and that's it. Um, I have booleans cutting out the center and then I put the chair in. So there's a load of stuff that I do that is um, really quite um, simple really, but builds up in layers. So you start with a block out, you move up to the next level of detail. 
what I did wrong on something like Maul's Scimitar was I didn't have all the blueprints when I started and I blocked everything out and then when I came to and then I added the detail in and I missed out the middle level of blocking and then when I wanted to go back and adjust just a couple of things I had detail and once you've got detail it becomes a lot harder to start manipulating things and keep the smooth curves etc just because um, it's easier to manipulate it when you've got five vertices to move than when you've got five with a bevel running down the middle to put a panel line in. So it is about making sure you don't dive into the detail too quickly. You need to just keep going and adding levels of detail, but you need to check it's all working first. Um, and I now understand how to get my connectors to fit and all that sort of thing. So it becomes a lot simpler for me on my third one. But you know, this is my third one pod race where I've done in the last few weeks. You need to work your way up. Um, you know, you don't, I'd have been better starting with this one, though I'd actually done the engine for Ben years ago, which is why I started that one. But this is a nice small one. I'd been better starting on something like this than I would have been starting on the really complex Sebulba, for example, which was the second one I did, just because um, you need to start small. So it, you also um, want to, um, you want to think about how you detail. Um, and whilst I'm modeling, when I'm at that block out phase, I got this really wrong on Mohonic. This is Mohonic's one. Uh, I think he's from Malastair. Um, I couldn't work out which way round to print it. And I printed it and it's got a slightly slanted um, clip hole here because it has to go to here. So there's an angle and this is therefore this clip hole, this piece prints flat onto the bill plate. I need to, and, and just, I can get that to print right. I ended up twisting almost every clip hole 90 degrees and changing. And this was printing flat across at first, across here. And I ended up printing it down the middle this way. And then that didn't print. So then it's now actually offset. So it actually prints offset, which is interesting. So it took me a while to work out how to print that one. It really did. And I think that's the same that you'll get. Sometimes you need to decide, are you printing for resin? This is a clearly resin print. For this, I mean, I'm doing this hand now, I'm posing him. Uh, normally you're asked if you can pose appendages, yes you can. Um, I didn't bother posing the fingers because actually I, they were okay flat on this, but you can even bend all the fingers around into claws and stuff. I just haven't got those controls up for simplicity. Um, but I put that hand against his leg because it will make it easy to print. I'm, I'm not sure whether his arms are thick enough at the moment. I may need to thicken them up for print purposes. It's been a while since I did resin tolerances rather than FDN. And, you know, here's the dude. He's actually only about this high. He's, he's a really diddy dude. Um, they all are. Um, so I've got this guy. He's definitely a resin print. He couldn't be FDN. But one thing you need to learn is if you're designing for 3D print, you need to learn how thin everything can be. And if it's going to be thin, how, will it be printable? Or do I need to attach it? So did his hand need to go on his base like that so that I can print those long, thin fingers? Or will those long, thin fingers print in midair? Um, you know, will they be all right in certain angles? If I have it hanging down like this, I've got four fingers that will need supporting when I do resin supports. If it's up like this, it may well print no problem. So you have to start also learning your 3D printers. Now, if you've already printed quite a bit of um, minis or in FDM, you've printed say one of the Second Dynasty ships or one of my terrain lots, you'll already have an idea. But what you may not realize is how much of an overhang you can get away with. So on an FDM printer, you're printing a layer at a time and it can't print in midair. It just can't print in midair. So you always have to have um, something supporting it. But I designed my stuff to be support free. So there's no supports on any of my items. So therefore when I'm designing it and thinking about how it's gonna print, I can't have a cable that just starts in midair because it just won't print. So everything has to be designed with the idea of how is this going to print? And interestingly, I did more scimitar without that. And when I came to chop it, it was just a Christmas project. When I came to chop it up to print, I was like, oh, I haven't done the legs. 
But I was having problems then with, I suspect they would have because of the scale wasn't that big, but I just put cubes on, which is just what there is in the ship, just a cube sticking out. But if I was designing that for me now, actually I never, they're only small, but I'd never put a cube on. What I would do is put a cube with a bevel so that it's beveled in and always at a 45 degree as a minimum angle. And as a result, you start to get these tweaks. One of the things with booleans with Blender, which when I shove them through formware, isn't a problem. But if you have two booleans, say you're cutting clip holes and you've got two overlapping cubes that you're cutting through. Um, if you cut with the same boolean cutter and cut out your clip hole, a Blender will make it non-manifold when it exports an STL. If you slightly offset your cutters, or if you, I generally just scale them to 0.99 or 1.01, .01, and if you do that and then cut, or you know, generally make sure you don't have any overlapping pieces, which isn't always possible, um, then it doesn't have a problem. It can cope with the difference if they're only off by 0 0.001. So you, you have to learn each of your programs to work out their various quirks. Now, Ben designs in 3DS Max, I think, and he has different problems to me designing in Blender compared to somebody going into Mesh Mixer. So um, each of them has their strong points and you need to learn. And there'll be a lot of Googling and trying to work out how it's changed between the different versions. But I can't really tell you each of the tweaks because it you look you there's so many you just have to learn as you go um norm says ah his hoodie has turned into a helmet with antennae yes i thought they were quite distinctive they're a little bit wobbly in some places but talking about printability in if they're wobbling over like that they need an extra support so i did them upright because that's what it looks like in the cgi pictures but i think in the actual movie they've always wobbled so yeah now, he's actually supposed to sit in this seat, and I'm still in two minds about this. So at the moment, his bum is too, his side thighs are too big, and I've cut them out. I might go back. I just got to the end of this, and I was putting him to print to see if he'd actually, um, I just auto-supported him in Chitterbox and put him to print um, on my little printer. But the whole point of doing this was so that he would sit in here. I could have, and he actually ironically has the fattest bottom of all the ones I'm going to design and he's got the thinnest seat because he's got side edges on it and he actually blobs over the seat and I can't decide whether I want to leave him blobbed over the seat he's got a little cutout which you'll see in the end blobbed over that seat or whether I want him to be I don't know yeah I don't know anyway I need to see if he fits and what, see what I feel like with it now I didn't bend these fingers here because the actual control panel there isn't bent um, but this is using rigging. Um, I had the Make Human rig and I had to reattach it. Um, and so I had problems with his body. His body was just all one big piece. Never really will move. I wouldn't be able to move the head down and move it with this particular figure. Um, but when it comes in for Make Human, you can move almost everything. Um, so here he is, just trying to get him to fit, to kind of pilot his own little ship that's already been designed but the biggest problem i had with make human is it brings it out and a really it brings it out as two meters whereas i actually design in blender um as if the meter is a millimeter because that's just the way blender actually scales when you export it so i'm used to working with bigger figures i find it easier to work with you know two meaning two millimeters than two equal than 0 0.0002 or whatever equaling two millimeters so i've just always had it set in meters and done it and this comes out a thousandth too small but actually it also needs to be in scale to fit into the ship so i actually ended up just scaling him in um i ended up scaling the ship in blender and then looking how much i would had to scale the ship and then scaling the figure when I exported it to fit back into the ship. So there we go. Um, Angie says, hello, Cathy, good to see you. You, you are doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Norm says, Bob is a bit blobby. Yeah, I think Bob is a bit blobby. And his finger though is so tight to go round that actually it created a bit of an overlap. It probably would have fixed in the software, but I just got rid of it by hand by dissolving vertices. If you want to keep a manifold mesh, you can dissolve vertices and just rejoin them a bit to get a 
and it doesn't create a hole. It might create a weird face, but it doesn't create a hole. Adam says, I have the side blobbing problem with sitting in my office chair. <laughs> oh, bless. Oh, yes. So, yeah, he has a very lumpy backside in this. This is because I should have left it on a quad, but I'd sculpted it and then sorted some stuff out and then decimated it. And I'm not doing that next time. I'm leaving a lot more in quad mesh and decimating it. Now, these were all too big. Um, and actually, what I needed to do was to decimate them all down. So once I'd, I fixed the bows, once I was happy, and had to go manipulate the sleeves and some of the stuff where his arms had moved through things, I had to go and manipulate some of that to work better, um, which is just a problem I find with moving clothes when you're doing quite extreme poses with your figures, like sitting. Um, uh, yeah, he's, he's very bulbous, so yeah. So anyway, I had to go and fix that, and then I had to decimate all the mesh down because it was too big to actually, it was just a massive file. And nobody needs that many vertices on a file. So I, a lot of what this is sat here doing is actually churning, trying to get the mesh down to a decent amount. Probably had one or two biscuits too many, says Richard. Well, you know what they say, a minute on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. Mm. That there is an example of why I shouldn't have got rid of the, um, decimated the mesh before I did all my posing. Live and learn. Um, I wasn't really, yeah, I wasn't really thinking that it was going to cause that much of a problem, but because it had gone into a weird decimated view, it was just, yeah. But anyway, it smooths out with a sculpt, no problem. Actually, the collar had also sucked in a weird way. It's attached to the spine, um, vertices group, but vertex group, but I just brought the other collar in from a non-posed model and put it over the top and it was fine. Um, so there we go. It's all about just tweaking it at this point because I just find you need quite a lot of geometry to get a smooth move and it far gets so big. So yeah, I think what I would do next time is have all the multi reses turned off, pose them and then put them on one at a time um, so that the file's able to be printed. And now I'm deleting out the bit where he, because he's round and the back of the chair is square. I'm actually just deleting out. Um, I'm using a boolean to cut his back. Then I realized the chair wasn't the best thing to use, so I actually used a cube later, swapped it over to a cube. So um, I spent a lot of time talking through getting started. And I think um, it is a journey. And I think the answer that I, the thing I would say most is be kind to yourself if you haven't done 3D printing before. Hard surface modeling, and by that I mean things that are like cars and spaceships and buildings is much easier for me than this type of thing. But there are some people who are all soft and sculpty and run, work with a pen and they would love to be able to just sculpt this figure from scratch. I'm very much, a, I really like using manipulating vertices and moving them and tweaking them, but there's no way I could have done that to do wrinkles. So I'm, I'm having to combine both of them in here and I'm just butting it Gates working out which is the best way to do things. Um, and it's been a great learning curve, this. I really have learned so much about, or reminded myself of so much. But I remember when I was doing Ahsoka, she's got a huge cloak. And I tried to sculpt the cloak and it didn't look very good. But I went in and used um, vertices and subdivision surface modifier. And I got it to work really quickly, really well by just using a proportional editing and moving them. So there's no right or wrong way to do things. And if you like sculpting, sculpt. If you don't like sculpting, if you prefer hard surface, you can generally get quite a long way towards things using just hard surface modeling. And if you want to do a face to a specific, make humans a great way to start, or you can use pictures. I did a Tomb Raider from scratch as practice. I don't think it really looked like her, but you know, I used all the sort of side on and front views and everything. If you want um, to learn how to do buildings and things like that, there would be, it, to me, it's all about going on YouTube and working out how to do a specific thing. Now on this collar, when I was doing the sculpt, I'd seen a video that said you could do it like this. And I tried it for a good half hour. And I couldn't get it to work like the video worked. And I don't know if it's because he was on Blender 2.8 and I was on Blender 4, or if it was just that I hadn't set something quite right. But sometimes you just go, 
Hmm. And actually, in most of these 3D modeling programs, there's, there's many different ways to do the same thing. Certainly in Blender, th there are many different ways to do an identical thing. You can see the little cutout for his, um, uh, his seat there. I could actually just take the side off the seat because it's one part, it plugs in separately, and let him flop over it. And I am tempted to just not have that seat um, cut there and, and let him, you know, just flob, if that makes sense. So has anyone got any other questions? Oh, and um, Norm says, I think he's quite the character. He is really cute. Um, I'm hoping, I think that's the end there. Yay. I'm hoping that he actually prints all right. So when he came out, he was non-manifold, not a surprise. Sometimes when you're sculpting, you can easily put in, especially putting a lot of heavy, dense mesh in. Um, mostly what I've done so far is stone textures. But once you've done that, um, you can easily make it non-manifold and it can be a while to fix it. And I've done it manually and I know how long that takes. But if you've got NetFab or something like that, it will sort it out a lot quicker. But it also gets rid of all the interior geometry. So you end up with just the exterior geometry, whereas I prefer my STLs to stay um, with all of their geometry intact so I can go back and use them. Um, so it is, it's, it's an interesting, I got very caught with that once when I was trying to adjust files because my print testers asked for extra ones and I couldn't because I really couldn't work out what version I was on. The other thing, actually, that's a really good point. When you're doing this, it's really important to have loads of versions and really good version control. So my power save that I use on Blender saves 01, 02, 03, 04, 05. And I tend to save a new version every day or two, um, just in case something corrupts or you have problems or you can go back. I'm also on Dropbox that will keep them for 30 days. So I can, if I overwrite by mistake, like say I applied that pose and then went, oh, I didn't want it applied. I wanted to do this. Um, when I was posing them, when I did the standing one, I forgot for the sitting one, I had one version, just a complete file saved with all the poses on. And then the next version, everything was applied and all the meshes were fixed for the distortions where they were. You need to think very much about making sure you always have a good backup system and that you always have loads of different save versions because it's really important that you don't lose hours of work um, if something crashes. And Blender's actually very stable. It, what I find is I go, oh, I just want a bit more detail on there. It's looking a bit blocky. And I whack one more on subdivision surface and it just sits there and churns because I've actually tried to put too much geometry on. And what I probably should have done is added a little bit, maybe extra geometry in the base mesh rather than just expecting the modifier to add everything in. And generally the most you can ever get on a subdivision surface is four, but I have put it to five on some meshes and regretted it. So there's, um, so it's a journey. Once you have that journey and you've started it, you'll only get there with practice. Um, if you're not, able to put in a lot of practice it will take you longer each time you do something to remember what you've done the time before now i'm doing hours every day of modeling um, so this this took 16 hours with a lot of dead ends i know um, that the um, next one will be eight hours and the one after that maybe four hours and if i was doing humans and i had my say clones so dark fire design does some great clones He's already got all the base clones and maybe eight poses. So if he wants to add markings or change things or make them into an arc or tweak things, it's automatically a lot quicker because he's not starting again doing it from scratch. It's the same with this. The more 3D printing you do, the more assets you have lined up. So if I look at um, my third pod racer, for this, I didn't have to design the stand. I did have to shorten it to be the right height. I didn't have to design the cutter for this. I didn't have to design this base because I'd already done it. It got the cut out on the bottom. It got the line markings on. I didn't need to really design this connector. All I needed to do was tweak um, this aesthetic on this end. I didn't need to you know, change this. Um, I already had ideas about the seat 
so this seat is very similar to the first one but I've tweaked the sides and back a bit but it was the same start point seat um, this bit here I knew the cutter that wanted to go in it that this would fit I knew the cutter for this I knew the cutter for these I had all my um, these actually say left and right inside so you know which one goes with which I had all of that already done ready that I could just append and move so the assets to do the third one was much much quicker than to do the first one and it's a bit like that when you're doing your 3d modeling journey the first model you do will take you a long time you'll spend ages going oh, shift a I often um, get option a and option x confused control z undo one of the most useful keys you have um, you know and you'll go oh I did that and that really didn't work well and then you'll go oh I wonder and you might go google it you might find a youtuber who's done it and then you discover a shortcut or you subscribe to a course and watch them do it and you go that's how it works and I do recommend watching a few good courses when you start I've never found before anybody asks a good 3d printing course for blender um, I found a lot of things when I've been looking and what I found is texturing a lot of people use ZBrush and it's easier in ZBrush to texture it doesn't like it copes with the extra density a lot better so you find you look at different ways to do things and people say you can do texturing like this and you get oh that didn't really work for me and then you find someone else's video and he's, he scattered rocks and you go oh I remember Josh Gambrell has a great video on how to scatter rocks and it's from two years ago now and you, next time you want to do it you think I've done it three times and I still can't remember it and you go back and you have to watch the video again to remind yourself on how you did it but if you do 10 things with rocks in a row you don't need to go and watch the video again to remember how to do it when I was posing I had to go back and watch the video on how to pose because I couldn't remember how to pose the characters to get them to move because um, it'd been that long since I'd done it probably three years um, so it, it becomes quicker the more you do if you only ever get a few hours at the weekend to learn 3D modeling, it will take you longer and you need to have a better memory for what you've done before because you're just not getting the hours in. And if that's the case, be kind to yourself. If you're only doing a couple of hours at the weekend, it's a hobby. You, you, if you're going to do this sort of level of 3D modeling, it's a hobby in of itself. It's a process in itself. I'm not doing any concrete real life modeling at all at the moment because all my modeling is virtual what you'll find is you've transferred your modeling time from the workbench to the computer and if you don't want to do that learn the basics of how to take a bought file fix it maybe cut it up to fit on your build plate maybe distort it slightly or swap arms over if you want things like that um, don't feel you need to be able to get to the next step unless it's something you're actually interested in. But if you are interested, then find a program. Blender's incredibly powerful and commit to learning it. Get some courses, learn it, practice it, and it will get easier the more you practice and it will take time. Um, Norm says, is Blobby Bob still printing? He probably is. He's in the other room, though, so um, I won't go out in the middle of this with a few minutes to go. I think he was due off about 11. It was a six-hour print, it said, and I didn't put it to go till about five because I'd forgotten to do it earlier this morning. So, yeah. Norm, it was fascinating watching the process and his evolution. Yeah, and I, the next one will be a lot quicker, um, which is good because when I... I thought of exporting that at 4K and it was a terabyte. I was like, you what? Um, thanks, Tamsin. Tamsin says it was indeed. Richard said it was good to see Blobby Bob tonight. Blobby Bob. I'm probably not, I'm going to have to drop the Blobby because nobody turns up on their poster and says Blobby Bob. But um, definitely he'll be Bob, I think. So this is going to be Bob. Um, so I can rename all my files now. He's Bob. M Monique says, yeah, I used to do loads of virtual modeling when then when I started with model railways I now do all physical modeling and no virtual design yeah it is literally they are both modeling and um, it takes as long probably to do it in one as the other I like the exactitude you can get with 3d printing that I can't get when I try and cut a straight line in a piece of styrene but if you're building a plastic kit versus if you're 3d printing both of them take time if you're then going to design it it's going to take even longer so yeah 
Robinson Express, when you want to do something special and don't know how to do it, the best method is to find someone who can do it for you. If you can afford them. Um, I'm doing these characters, which to be fair, I have done a bit before. Um, I'm doing these characters because I can't actually afford anybody to do them and I want to be able to sell them. So, you know, it is, there is a joy in learning to do things yourself. And there is a time, like resin supports, where I'm actually going to get someone else maybe to do my resin supports because I tried twice and none of them printed well at all. And I need, and I couldn't get Chitterbox to hollow and put a hole in. I get it to hollow, I can get it to put the hole in. It just wouldn't put the hole in. And actually somebody else went off and did it for me and looked at it and put it um, into mesh mixer to do the hole. I do have mesh mixer. Blender doesn't hollow well and obviously lychee wouldn't export and oh, I was just having a nightmare. So um, Tim says Mr. Blobby. He's not pink with yellow spots. Um, Bob Quadro. I think it could be, um, yeah, Bob Quadro the fourth. Yeah, we still need to work on the names. I'm not sure Quadro, it might be a bit close to Quadrineros, but maybe Bob Fourpack. No, no, I don't know. I haven't got his last name yet. Bob Jetster. Hmm, Jetstar. We'll have to have a go. I'm definitely thinking that Sebulb was the bully. So he's bully something. Bully Bullhorn. Yeah. We're getting there. Right. We're getting near the end. Um, thank you everyone for coming. If you've got any questions afterwards, don't forget to pop them in the comments. Nobody's reminded you to hit likes. And we've got 52 likes and 43 concurrent viewers. So we've done well there. So thank you guys. Um, if you're not subscribed, remember to do that stuff. And um, if you want to know more about anything, I'm normally on my Discord. And um, yeah, and if anybody is going to the May 4th weekends to watch the 25th anniversary, um, The Phantom Menace, or to watch all three of them, enjoy it. I can't believe it's 25 years. And um, I do think Ewan McGregor gets better with age. I do think he actually looks better now than he did back in 1999. Maybe it's a good thing because I'm actually older as well. But yeah enjoy and i'll see you all next time thanks guys and if there's anything you want me to cover in these um because i'd done this all week i thought and i'd be doing it for patreon so i had the video shot anyway it's what i did this time um if you want me to do something else let me know just drop it in and i'll be happy to chat so thank you all for watching and i will see you next time thanks to norm timber and digger my moderators for moderating really appreciate it and um monique have a good day the rest of you probably have a good night and anything in between. Take care. Bye.